नमस्ते साइको एनालिसिस इन फिलोसॉफी आइडोल साइंस आइडोल एज अ पर्सनालिटी इन आर अर्लियर वीडियो वी हैव टॉक्ड अबाउट आइडोल एज अ क्रिस्टल इन दिस वीडियो वील टेक अप आइडोल एज अ पर्सनालिटी आइडोल साइंस इज अ लॉस साइंस but here we are going to explore various aspects of this uh, esoterical but lost science with our psychoanalysis consultant mr himanshu vaidya namaste mr vaidya uh, mr vaidya can we start with idols with personality and idols without personality idols can be with personality or without personality if they are with personality they can have a human personality or an animal personality or in the form of a plant or in the form of a god or in the form of something uh, which seems like a alien to us or the idol can just not have a personality it can just be a stone or it can be a diagram so idol can be both with a personality without a personality and often idols which are without a personality are endowed with personality by people by guru or by community okay and that has its own purpose but technically there is nothing to stop an idol from being an idol and working as an idol even without a personality can you give an example to clarify the point uh in some temples you will find idol of a god who is exactly like man it's not very uncommon in india very common in india where you can find a say for example a, a idol of lord rama where lord rama is exactly like a human being then you can have an anthropomorphic forms for example lord ganesha he is not exactly like a human being but partly like a human being and then you have the idol of shri chakra where you just have the idol of a yantra without any human form per se and then you have in many cases just a stone which is being worshiped the stone can be in any form right but the stone is then put up for worship in the form of an idol and in some cases the stone was consecrated by some realized person or some person with uh, some depth in the mystical area so both kinds of idols can exist with or without a personality human nature is such that if we find an idol without a personality it is natural for most people to create a mythology around it and endow that idol with a personality despite all of it some idols do survive without a personality for a long time uh, how do we differentiate between idols yantra and mandala i mean is there an overlap yeah it's a complicated question because essentially we are using all the three essentially is use of form we are using some geometrical form in all the three now there is a general answer to it and there are exceptions generally idol is used for social purposes idol is by and large permanent yantras are by and large used for personal purposes and once the use is done they are reverentially put aside uh mandalas are somewhat different most mandalas actually are like uh, visual qr codes a whole spiritual school with 
the entire way to enlightenment. So because there are many ways to enlightenment, each school has its own way and each school has its own spiritual package, its own mantras, its own exercises, its own rituals, its own yantras, its own uh, particular kind of gurus, it, its own practices and so on, its own experiences on the path and the entire path of a particular spiritual school is put down in a coded geometrical form in the mandala. So mandalas are more like uh, visual storehouses in a coded way of a particular school and its entire spiritual ecosystem around the path. So this is in general how the three are different. And this mandala is something where when a uh, expert sees it who is knowledgeable in the area, he can make out the meaning of each of the elements that are seen there. So the, it's like the you scan the QR code. So the guru is the scanner who can unlock the meaning of that QR code. So is it the whole uh, process uh, which is kind of encoded? Yes. Yes. Okay. For example, if you look at Sri Yantra, or if you look at the flat mandala of Sri Yantra, the 2D, it's a complete school of Sri Vidya. Of course, you require some help from outside. Everything cannot be put there, but largely it is there in essence. So this is in general. Now in exceptions, there are exceptions. For example, in certain cases, uh, if you say of overlap, is every idol not a yantra? Obviously, yes, every idol is a yantra. Every yantra may not be an idol, but definitely every idol is a yantra. Second, in certain exceptional cases, yantras are put up as idols for worship. Sri Yantra is one such idol, which is a yantra put in for worship. Similarly, there are many other geometrical forms which we can find in many temples put up in place of idols. So these are yantras which are put up as idols in exceptional cases. And then we have mandalas. Now mandalas are put to different uses also. In exceptional cases, the mandalas also are put up for worship as an idol. Or the mandalas are used for self-development. In the sense, uh, either one chooses which way to go into the uh, into the mandala from either of the four uh, doors, or in an inner sense when it is used, then Carl Jung used to say about it that one of the processes of self development unconsciously when it comes up visually in dreams, it is like rounding of an angular mandala. So the forms which are angular first start getting rounded into a wholeness of the self or the wholeness of the personality. So those are exceptional uses of mandala both as an idol, in some cases as a yantra, very very rare and in some cases as an inner tool to decipher uh, the path of development, whether it is right or not following the true path, I mean the swift path. Uh, how do people in general use the personality of an idol? Uh, the personality of the idol is very important and people endow it with it. For example, if somebody has a problem of the root chakra, problem related to fear or anger, he would go for use of a particular idol which has a personality elaborated by mythology or spiritual literature which can help the person internalize that thing, identify with it and try to overcome the fear and the anger issues. So this is for a psychotherapeutic purpose. Similarly, people use it 
for development of one's potential. And people also use it for more mystical purposes to uh, sort of address the karmic or issues of prosperity. And this is a very difficult area to pronounce whether it is scientific or not. For every one genuine claim, there are 10 uh, non-genuine claims in the market. So controversy aside, uh, empirical factualness aside, uh, from knowledge standpoint, uh, people use it for therapeutic purposes, prosperity purposes, karmic purposes, mystical exploration, and some even try to use it in the form of weaponization. Uh, does the idol have a uh, human or anthropomorphic personality? Uh, not always, but mostly yes. 99% of idols have a personality and out of that, almost 90% human or anthropomorphic. It has to do with the system that we have, that we can relate better to human or anthropomorphic form than to the formless or to other forms which are not human and anthropomorphic. So it has to do more with our system characteristics rather than the characteristics of the form per se of the idol, which dictates that most idols are either human or anthropomorphic. Uh, what are the factors related to developing the personality of the idol? The prime factors are what is the purpose, what purpose you want it to put for. For example, if somebody wants to develop an uh, idol around which the whole package is to be built for enhancing masculinity and courage, it's very difficult to have a feminine idol there. Or uh, one is into a spiritual path where one has to work on the Muladhar Chakra and an idol is created for it. Obviously, the idol is going to be fearsome, violent or something of that sort. It's not going to be a very benign kind of a form. It's not going to be a very sattvic, soft and feminine form. It's going to be a very uh, wild, fearsome, almost brutal form that you see in the Tantric Devis. I'm talking of the referring to left hand tantra. So first is the purpose. Second is the person who is going to undertake it. How much can he take or how much does he need? The third is the uh, path that the guru is expert in because he can lead people only in the area he knows. And what area he knows, he has to create something based upon that. He cannot give to his disciple something he cannot handle or he is not expert at. The fourth is uh, the social acceptability. For example, if you are trying to address the Oedipus through this route, you can't be explicit about it. The fifth is uh, what is the path and what idols are going to come next. It need not be only one idol across the whole path. So as you work with various chakras, each chakra will require a specific kind of idol. So what way you are moving? There are three ways essentially of moving. You can either move from the bottom chakra to the top, top to the bottom, or start from the heart chakra. Three popular ways of moving about. So they will also dictate what kind of uh, personality you want to create to start off with. And if they already have, you have used two or three personalities, then that itself will have an impact on what next personality to create. So it's a sequence and the prior and the post, they also have an effect on the personality that you create. Uh, is mythology related to this aspect of the ideal idol? Yeah, it's almost like a ready-made package that you are given. Because just as you want an idol and you want it to end up with a personality, somebody else had a similar need and he already created a package. 
so these are ready made packages which are tried and tested over generations so mythology is one component of that package that today when you look at lord ganesha you already have uh, stories about him and a personality in your mind about what kind of person or god he is so that personality got created because of tradition because of mystical purpose spiritual purpose social purposes and so on so if these packages are not there then the guru has to create personalities around forms because it's very difficult to directly relate to geometrical forms even if they are anthropomorphic so unless we endow that form with a personality it's very difficult to relate and one of the very important elements of uh, idol science is object relations that's a very deep uh, science of object relations of course there are mystical occult parts but from a psychological standpoint very deep science of object relations and the relation is easy if you have an anthropomorphic form endowed with a personality later on after one has become adapted this a person even without a guru can create uh, forms and endow them with personalities and use them with the process which he has learned many times over are there some do's and don'ts involved in this process <clears throat> many of them if you have a general purpose idol then the do's and don'ts are less if you have a special purpose idol they are many in general purpose uh the usual do's and don'ts relate to diet lifestyle concentration the physical distance within which you have to be in the idol and follow certain rituals but when there is special purpose for example you are working on something very deep like in psychoanalysis we would say the paranoid schizoid split or the edipus or the aggression or uh, ego disintegration then in such cases the idol use the personality use the process use the entire package has many do's and don'ts so the more specific and the deeper issue you are trying to deal with the more esoteric or deeper result you want more are the do's and don'ts for example in certain temples which are meant to enhance femininity men are not allowed in certain temples women are not allowed in certain temples children are not allowed because the purposes are such and because of those purposes the form of the idol the rituals are such that they are not uh, conducive to the well being of everybody they are put there only for a particular purpose these are like medicines which will work very well on certain people and have very high side effects on others so this collateral damage in society to prevent that there are very high do's and don'ts and the more powerful practice you go in deeper practices you go in more are the do's and don'ts and they actually inform the whole of the lifestyle from the everyday schedule to diet to what goes on what what goes inside the mind to practices and so on or can different idols with different personality be used in succession and is it always uh, project based uh yes they can be used in succession but it is not always project based but it can be project based right so there is something called agman and something called visarjan agman is the coming in and the visarjan is reverentially giving it back to the nature letting it go off so uh, as you move from chakra to chakra you successively use different idols with different personalities now once you are done with a idol and the personality do you just let it go off or you continue to be with it is a issue of judgment if the person feels the need for it or the guru feels need for it 
even when you move to the second idol you still retain the first idol in some cases in some cases you get done with the first and only then you move to the second in certain cases uh some of the idols are kept forever and others are uh engaged with and then let go of so it all depends upon the path and the person but successively different personalities and different idols and rituals can be used in fact they have to be used as you move from the chakra to the next chakra uh, can this personality be used for therapy yes uh for example if somebody had a difficult experience with the mother then creating an idol and a personality <coughs> of a all good mother and relating with it is very therapeutic now how to relate to it so that the therapy therapeutic effects can be harnessed is something where the whole package and the expertise of the guru comes in so it is not just sitting with an idol and endowing it with personality imagined by us but a complete package that has to be put into action so based upon what the needs are personalities can be created some people who have need for a very good mother create that kind of personality some who have need for a good father create a masculine all good personality some who want to overcome the fear they create terrible personalities of very brutal and aggressive men or women and then be with them so that over a period of time they get desensitized some who want to internalize very beautiful uh, things to enhance their aesthetic part of it or activate it they get in touch with such uh, idols and personalities some who have a difficulty of uh, isolation of affect or inability to love they create such idols with whom they get into a very loving relationship a very romantic relationship so different personalities can be put to different uses in sequence or separately or even together if it comes to it uh, how does this entire science work in terms of its psychoanalytic meta psychology it works on five pillars from a psychoanalytic meta psychology standpoint first is object creation that you are creating an object either on paper or in some material in 3d form and endowing it with personality using stories using mythology the second is object relation how do you relate to it and there is a very deep process about it of three stages of tanmayta tadrupta and ekatmata uh so first you get into uh a continuous as i mean a very frequent communion with the personality and then you almost feel as though you are always together and then somehow uh the otherness is lost so the process happens and this is a process of internalization then you have identification then you have the separation and the mourning right but in between after internalization you have a very important process of transmuting internalization which is a very important element that the transmuting internalization uh sets of those healing processes which are necessary so this five step process of object creation internalization transmuting internalization identification and separation and mourning these are very important elements from a meta psychological standpoint how this thing works apart from the mystical aspects spiritual aspects of it it seems in tibetan and tantric approaches the use of idols uh, personality is uh, heavy and central can you explain that yes it is true 
Uh, Tibetan practices are very heavily influenced by Tantra, particularly left hand Tantra and Agora. And uh, the personalities which are used are very fearsome because the path here is to go from the bottom chakra to the top. So when you go into the bottom chakra, you are full dealing with aggression and fright. And the second uh, chakra, you are dealing with sexuality. And the third, you are dealing with power. So you are dealing essentially with the Kleinian, Freudian kind of a world. You are dealing with aggression, brutality, sexuality, sadism, mesochism, okay? all the component instincts. And because you are trying to make a transformation in this area, you are uh, discourse, the idols, the whole package, okay? the exercises, the rituals, they work in this area. And therefore, uh, the personalities that they use, not only they use a lot of personalities, but most of them are terrifying personalities, very fearful personalities, very aggressive personalities. And some of the personalities have to do with uh, the Tibetan mythology also. So many of the idols which are used are also have to deal with the mythology of that particular place, which has a combination of traditional stories and Tibetan art, which has an element of imagination, artistic imagination, mysticism, as well as codification of past knowledge into art. So this is where we see a very rampant, not rampant, it's a very common use, very pervasive use of uh, personalities in spiritual processes, personalities related to idols in spiritual processes. Uh, can the idol's personality be used for purposes other than uh, healing? Yeah. To realize one's full potential, it can be used for a better quality of life and uh, uh, it can also be used for exploration of mystical realms because it is believed in that area that you can actually get in touch with some mystical forces in nature through use of personalities, which is easier than directly getting in touch with those forces. Uh, is the efficacy of an idol's uh, use uh, dependent on factors which are other than the individual trying to use the idol? Yes. Very much so. It's a full package with many variables. So the final effect of it depends upon many variables. Most important, of course, is the sincerity of the person and the level of the person. But uh, equally important are other set of parameters. For example, how expert the guru is. What is the idol in question as a crystal and as a personality? What are the efficacy of rituals? How well does the guru understand the psychodynamics of the person and at what elemental levels can he intervene? What is the power that he has? So, and of course, how sincerely the person follows the entire package, which can go into lifestyle, into diet, into dream exercises, into rituals, into social work and many other things. Uh, how does this relate to uh, dream work, lucid dreaming and guided imagination? Uh, it's very important in the process because once you get into a spiritual school which is following or using an idol uh, and the personality of an idol, uh, the teacher asks for dreams <clears throat> and also instructs the person in lucid dreaming. And that dream analysis is used to make out how well the progress is going on and if some changes need to be made and what is the condition in the unconscious mind. So dream analysis and lucid dreaming 
are a very important element of the whole package. Is this uh, done only in the Western approach, which we call the therapy or uh, no, no. counseling or healing, or is it in the Eastern approach as well? In fact, I was in my mind, I was in <coughs> Tibetan schools. Okay. If you if you go to the Tibetan spiritual schools, and there are many of them, each of the each of them with their own package of spiritual uh, ecosystem and practices. Uh, most of the Tibetan schools make very good use of dream analysis and lucid dreaming. So it is very important when you are following a particular path that you discuss your dreams with the teacher so that he can make whatever changes are necessary in that full package. Because when you uh, talk about dreams, I uh, mostly, uh, I mean, Sigmund Freud or Carl Jung uh, come to mind. So I just wanted to clarify this. But uh, the uh, all ancient schools, whether it is in the Mediterranean, Tibetan, uh, in Sri Lanka, or even in India, all spiritual schools have their own way of analyzing dreams. So they all have an implicit model of the mind in some cases very well articulated. For example, in India, the yogic model of the mind or tantric model of the mind, which is also very dear to the way the Tibetans use it, is very well articulated. So fully developed spiritual schools have their own model of the mind, their own uh, way to liberation, right? and therefore their own package and the idol as a crystal, idol as a personality, idol as many other things is an important element of that whole package. And one of the elements in the package is dream analysis and lucid dreaming. Uh, is the science of chakras related to the idol science and our subject of discussion today? Yes, because uh, once we say that the chakras are the coordinating center of the system, then all the five bodies of the system will have to interact there. And corresponding to each chakra, then you have something related to each of the senses, thinking and emotion. So if you look at this decentralized operation of the system, by saying there are chakras which are decentralized locations and coordinators, then for each chakra, you will have a particular color, a particular element, a particular sound, a particular visual and a particular idol with a unique personality. So in tradition, the most popular package is to see Lord Ganesha in the root center. And for each of the centers above, a particular God, a particular color, a particular sound, a particular smell, a particular substance of touch and so on. So the personality uh, that is given to an idol and after which the idol is being used depends upon for which chakra are you going to use that idol for. So based upon which chakra purification, because essentially the whole thing ultimately boils down to purification of chakras. That is where the pathology is going to be healed and human potential is going to be realized. So if that is the basis, then there is a separate idol with a distinct personality for each of the chakras. So obviously, as you move up, you have to use different idols with different personalities and with different rituals, of course. Uh, is esoteric mysticism at most elemental levels uh, usually found in the depths of Vedic or Agora mysticism? And is there a uh, tenet to personify forces and elementals of existence? Yes. It's a very deep question because uh, the fundamental approach is to personify the forces and all entities we want to work with. For example, if we want to work with uh, heat or fire, uh, we would not we would, I mean the aspirant would personify fire into a fire god. 
or sun into a sun god or any force of nature into a corresponding god wind into a wind god and when you personify in an anthropomorphic form the understanding is it is easier to get in touch with those forces and get benefit out of it than otherwise to deal with them directly in abstract form which you cannot see or cannot feel through the senses for example any of the fundamental forces of nature very few of them can be felt by human beings directly except for heat i mean fundamental entities of nature not fundamental forces of nature so when we look at fundamental entities of nature very few of them can be directly felt with our senses we may know it from laboratory we may know it from effects but directly we can feel very few there is a limitation of senses but we want to deal with them one good way is to give them an anthropomorphic form and then deal with them or engage with them so in most of the indian mystical approaches personification is a very powerful tool very common tool that the entity we are trying to deal with personify it give it a personality and through that try to get in engagement with it and fire is the most common where one gets in touch with the burning fire and over a period of time develops some sort of uh, uh, relationship with that fire and that agni then helps us that physical agni that helps us then get in touch with many subtle forms of agni which are spread out in the human system and outside world so there from there you go into the agni which is in the stomach and then the agni into the cells and then the agni which sustains life itself and then the agni in the material itself so at the very elemental level you are dealing with agni which is the prime source of all energy so it's very difficult to deal directly with abstract things so the the easier way out is to personify it and through that go into it and this is a very common uh, approach both in the uh, vedic yogic mysticism as well as in the uh, tantra we come to the last question uh, how do you see the future of this uh, uh, as evolving uh, future is very interesting i am not sure what will be proved right or wrong but the future is interesting that is for sure and uh, we need to figure out uh, research out actually how well it works or not because the counterpoint can be that when you are asking the person to be with the idol personality are you not manufacturing psychosis because you are asking somebody to be with the personality that does not exist you are almost asking him to go into a sort of a uh, uh, overrated idea two steps behind hallucination so that of course is a strong counterpoint and therefore empirical research on what type of personality for what type of problem and what type of person and how to use it and how to create it and with virtual reality computer games the digital tools that we have virtual reality that we have we can actually develop this idol science at a much higher level using the new tools the fundamentals kept the same so i see very exciting possibilities of research here whether what we are talking about gets proven right or wrong science of future will tell us yeah but uh, yeah we don't know what is yet to come in uh, this area but uh, i mean whether science proves it or not but this definitely has been found effective let's put it that way you know it is uh, it is a knowledge which has uh, which has been found to be true by tradition over hundreds and thousands of years so the question of whether it helps or not some people is not a question whether it can help everyone in a predictable understandable way 
and whether it is something into itself apart from auto suggestion and placebo those are the separate uh, questions my personal feeling is i am very optimistic about it that uh, we may not be uh, in company of an omnipotent object which will find which will solve all our problems but definitely we are uh, in my belief at least with something that will be one more tool not only one more tool one more basket full of tools for healing and self development so the future uh, evolution of this whole thing might uh, kind of blend the secular and the non secular yes right? true, true. <clears throat> okay, so that's really interesting yeah uh, it definitely brings together the believer and the non believer whether it proves the belief of the believer is a separate question or the non belief of the non believer yeah <laughs> true <laughs> right yeah and anyway, we end it here <clears throat> it was really an insightful discussion uh, let's see i think it should be very helpful for all the listeners thank you so much do write to us at hvindia@gmail.com namaste <laughs>